families, congregations joined together in one place and believing God for a blessed future as we move forward. You know what? God is doing good things. I have like two people right now that believe that. I'm not going to get that anyway, all right? But if I can, I'm going to persuade you and convince you that God is really doing good things. Amen. Right? Now, if you watch the news, you will hear that, uh, yeah, thank you, Tim, great talk, fantastic. Uh, you watch the news. How many know that any channel on TV makes its money from people viewing the station, right? That's how they make their money, right? Because they can sell uh, spots for advertisers and they can charge more money if they have more people looking. So their goal, is to always get as many people looking as possible, right? That's pretty cool. And, uh, and the stuff that sells and the stuff that gets people looking is always the most controversial stuff. Notice that? It's all the stuff to keep you afraid, all the stuff to, 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 you know, that's problems and difficulty and all that type of stuff. And so um, here's one thing that is actually really, really good right now about L.A. County. While the media has been talking about the cases going up and up and up, and they have been, there's no denying that, that's been happening, uh, that the COVID case is going up. If you actually track it, I'm a numbers guy, and so I look at this stuff like multiple times a week. You'll notice that actually our rise happened at the exact same time last year. And it will go down, guess what, at the exact same time as it did. And so we're probably about two or three weeks away from it going back down. Uh, from its rise. But here's the crazy thing. The crazy thing is that even though the cases have gone up, the number of people passing away due to COVID has not increased at all. It has remained the same. Lives are being protected. How many can say praise Jesus for that? That is a good thing. That is a good thing. So while the news is telling you it's all horrible, they're not telling you the good part of the news. That is, lives are being protected. God has been good. And also, Regarding uh, the new facility that we will be moving into, the new property, um, this is not a date, okay? There isn't a date for you yet, but it's going to be soon, very soon. I know, you hear me say that like every week. You're like, okay, you've been saying soon for forever. Yeah, okay, just a little bit of patience. But I, I can promise you, today we're one week closer than we were last week, so, you know, that's good news, right? Right? Listen, we just have a few things we needed to get done. Interestingly enough, when they built the, the building, the sanctuary, the auditorium, in 1962, I think it was, they actually put in a central air system, which is amazing. But you know what they did? They only put in central heat. They forgot the air conditioner. I have no idea. But, and I have been in there so many times this summer and you know, the middle of the day, and it is hot in there. And imagine if they fill that room up with hundreds of people, I mean, how, how that's going to be. So we're working right now, there's an air conditioning system that's going in, and there's a whole lot of work to do with that. And to drill in the concrete and you know, get stuff done. But uh, that, I think, I think that air might be done uh, this week. And I will be praising Jesus, so that way I can walk in there and like turn on the air and be like, all right, I can chill out. Uh, but uh, but we're, we're almost there. We've just got a few more things to get done. And then we will be in. I've been asked this question uh, now by multiple people. So if you've asked me and you think I'm saying it only because you asked me. No, I've actually been asked by multiple people. A lot of people have been wondering, well, what are we going to do for, for youth? Is that going to be started? Yes, yes, and yes. We are going to be doing stuff for young people. Absolutely. Because, you know, three of my kids are youth age. So, uh yeah, they want it too. And, um, and so we'll be doing that. But our first goal is to get ourselves into the property. And once we get there and get started, then we'll be starting a whole bunch of other stuff. So good things are out ahead of us. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right. We're going to be in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapters 12 and 16. Numbers 12 and 16. Last week, I was in Numbers chapter 13, and we're just going through the entire Bible, and it's going to take us however long it's going to take us, and we'll see when we finish. But uh, 
It, it looks like we're on a trajectory somewhere in the two years or less range, I hope. We'll see. Um, but, uh, but we're going to be, we're, we're going backwards and forwards today, just by a chapter. We're going backwards to Numbers chapter 12, and then we'll do Numbers chapter 16. And uh, th this story is about Miriam and Aaron. Aaron, who was the brother of Moses and, and Miriam. And they, uh, they, well, Aaron specifically was in charge of all the worship of the people of Israel, right? He was the, the, the high priest. And so he was in charge of the stuff they were doing at the temple, or in this case, it was the tabernacle before the temple was built. And, and, and so the, these two have a concern regarding Moses that we're going to get into. And what, what I want to do, though, is talk about this passage. I, I've heard a lot of pastors talk about this passage in Numbers chapter 2. And they'll typically use this passage as a way to say something like this. Do whatever I tell you to do or God's going to strike you down dead or something like that, you know. And uh, yeah, that's not what I'm going to be doing today. Um, but it's a great passage to learn some important things about how we can be leader followers. Yeah, you heard me right. Leader followers. How many leaders are in this room right now? Raise your hand if you're a leader. All right. Some of you might be a little bit confused about it. So let me ask another question. All right. How many of you are a parent? Parents, raise your hands. All right. All of you parents, you're a leader. You're a leader. So look at somebody close to you. Just tell them you're a leader. You're a leader. All right. Okay. How many have friends? Anybody have friends? Some people are like, yeah, I'm working on that one. I'm a little behind. <laughs> All right. If you have friends, how many have gone out with friends to a restaurant and you stood together like in a parking lot, a car, and a house, wherever, for like 20 minutes, deciding where you were going to go out to eat? Because everybody had a different opinion, right? And how many of you, your opinion won out? You, you won, and you went to your place. Not enough hands. It means I need to teach you how to influence people, apparently. Uh, but, okay, if your opinion won, you exercised leadership. Because leadership is influence. That's all it is. Leadership is influence. And so if you have influence anywhere you are, in your place of work, you can lead people without even being in charge. Did you know that? You can lead people without being in charge. You know, when my kids come up to me and ask me for something, and they ask me enough times, I might end up, might, my keyword, might, end up giving in to them. And in that moment, who led who? Did I lead them? No. No, they actually led me. They influenced me. And so position does not determine leadership. Leadership is determined simply by influence. Everybody say the word influence. But the best leaders in the world are the best followers. The best leaders are the best followers. Let me put it this way. I think you would all agree that the best leader that ever existed on planet Earth was Jesus Christ. Would anybody agree with me on that? I mean, if you think about it, in three years, he started an entire movement that today, 2,000 years later, involves two billion people across the planet Earth. There is not a single human being that has ever accomplished anything remotely close to that. And today, we celebrated and honored him through communion. There is nobody that does that. For any other person that passed away on this planet, that gave their life like Jesus did. He was the best leader. But get this, Jesus, as the best leader, was also the best, anybody know where I'm going? The best follower. Because it was Jesus said, that said, I do what I see my Father do. So the best leaders are the best followers, and the best followers are the best leaders. And all I want to do today is something really simple for all of you. It doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter titles, it doesn't matter positions. It just matters that you consider yourself a person that God can use to influence others. And that to do that to the best of your ability means that you would become a person that follows Jesus closely. Can anybody say amen to that? And, um, and I want to use this story here to talk through this and to just share some thoughts with each, with each and every one of you. So let's jump in. Chapter 12 of Numbers, 
Starting in verse 1. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized. Everybody say the word criticized. They criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. The important thing about this is just to understand that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, would only marry inside of the Jewish people, right? With, with, within their, their group, their nation. But Moses, the leader of Israel, had married somebody who was outside of the faith, who was not a Jewish person, right? So they said, has the Lord spoken only for Moses? Hasn't he spoken for us too? But the Lord heard them. Everybody say that with me. But the Lord heard them. I've got to tell you right now, careful with what you say, because God is always listening. Like a young person going off on your parents, you know, in the room, they might not hear you, but, uh, yep, God does, right? And the uh, parents, same thing. So I'm not going to point out just the young people, parents going off about your kids after they've gone to bed. Yeah, God's hearing that too. He's hearing it all. But the Lord heard them. I love verse 3. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible for just an interesting reason. It says this, now Moses was very, what does it say right there? Very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. So this verse says that Moses was the most humble person on the planet earth. I have a question for you. Does anybody know who wrote the book of Numbers? Moses did. He's like, hey, I am the most humble person on the planet. That's like Elon Musk writing a book and just saying, Elon Musk is the most intelligent human being on the planet. It's like, maybe, or maybe not, but you know, okay. Uh, now, it is the Word of God, so we consider this to be true. And it was true, because if you look at the life of Moses, he actually did display remarkable humility. And we're going to see that in this story today. But this leads me just to the first thing that I want to say. Because if you want to be a good leader, follower, understand this for you. This is going to challenge you right now. Constant criticism creates Conflict. Yeah, four words that start with C. It just sounded really good. Constant criticism creates conflict. You see, the reality is, is that Miriam and Aaron, before they ever went and spoke to Moses about what they disagreed with him on, were having their own conversations before that. That's the only reason they would have gone together to say it. We know that because... They had to have talked together in order to go together to talk to Moses together about it. And so they were already talking about it. I would just imagine Mary and Aaron, they were just chilling one day and they're like, you know what? We, we, we just don't like what Moses did. He's making some decisions. We just, we don't agree with him. And you know what? And, and then he married this woman who's not Jewish. And so you know what? It's just not okay. Moses is out of line. He is out of order. We got to go do, deal with this. And so constant criticism creates conflict. Now let me be clear. I believe in a thing called constructive criticism, all right? Where you are willing to help somebody out, go to the next level, improve in an area or whatever. That's fine. There is nothing wrong with that. But there is a difference between that and a person that just speaks ill all the time of everybody else and decisions that are made. And I just, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I don't like that thing on the menu that you want me to eat. I don't like this. I don't like that we're leaving the house to go here. Or I don't like that we're staying at the house instead of going somewhere. I mean, I have five kids. Can I just tell you that it is guaranteed that whenever we do anything, there will always be one or two that disagree with what we're doing. It's, it's guaranteed. Now, if you think that happens among like two kids or three kids, imagine even more with, you know, five. And so it happens a lot. And uh, the Lord is helping us through it. You know? But uh, constant criticism, a spirit of, uh, of criticism is not something that should represent followers of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I actually, people that spend their time criticizing, I really don't pay much attention to. I, I'd rather pay attention to a person that wants to get something done and improve and make stuff better. Because here's actually the key difference that you can tell. 
A person that has a spirit of criticism will never offer you a better way of doing something. They will only ever complain about what's being done. I don't like it that way, so what do you recommend we do? I don't know, I just know I don't like it that way. Like, yeah. And so if you have a spirit of criticism, I'm not accusing anybody in the room, because you're all amazing people, okay? But if you do, you can just say, Lord, Lord, would you deliver me from that spirit of criticism? I want to be a leader, yes, but a follower of you that contributes rather than takes away. Can anybody say amen to that? So let's be those types of people. Miriam and Aaron most definitely were not. They were not. And they were criticizing Moses on something that he couldn't even change. What were they expecting him to do? Divorce his wife? I mean, he literally couldn't change that. But they wanted to criticize, criticize, criticize. And I want to talk about that, verse 1, real quick. We'll go back to verse 1. Because it says that they criticized him because he married this Cushite woman. So he wasn't supposed to marry a person outside of the Jewish people. But watch this. When Moses went to the desert for 40 years before he led the people of Israel out of Egypt, that's when he got married. And guess what? When he lived in the desert for 40 years, he was not around a single other Jewish person. He was alone. And so he married. And that's pretty normal. And that's what he did. And not, another amazing thing that you see in Scripture, if you read the genealogy in the book of Matthew about the, the ancestors of Jesus, as you realize that there are women in Jesus' genealogy that were not Jewish women. God, in his sovereignty, included people from outside of the Jewish people to be a part of his saving plan for all of humanity. It's incredible. So Moses didn't make a mistake, okay? Moses did not make a mistake. Tell somebody next to you, Moses didn't make a mistake. So this is important, but it does tell us something important about us. How many have made mistakes in their lives? All right. How many have made, like, a lot, a lot of mistakes in your life? Yeah. And I, I, I want you to settle into this truth for your life. The past doesn't define your future. The past doesn't define your future. You see, they were trying to use Moses' past decision against him. Again, Moses' decision was not bad, but they were still trying to use it against him. The past does not define your future. 20 years of amen. We do that in Boston. Come on. 20 years ago, I was driving my car down the street. I think I was on Nordoff, if I'm not mistaken. I was driving my car down the street, and I was looking in the rear view mirror, admiring how good I look. And, um, no, I wasn't. But I was looking in the rear view mirror. And I was looking in the rear view mirror, and there was a car in front of me, but they were a good distance ahead of me. And I looked in the rear view mirror a little bit too long. And I didn't realize that the car in front of me had completely stopped when I, and for no reason. At least I don't think so, because there was nothing in front of them. There was no car turning. There was no other car parked. There was nothing. They just literally stopped. And it was too late when I finally focused my attention in front of me. And how crazy is that? Because I was looking forward, but because I was looking forward to the rearview mirror, my eyes didn't actually see what was in front of me. That tells you something about the ability of us to focus, that you can't focus on the past and the future at the same time. And I finally looked forward, realized the car had stopped, slammed my brakes, Thankfully, I did hit them, but I didn't hit them that hard. Um, it ended up costing thousands of dollars of damage to my car, but it only left a scratch. Literally, a single little, like, half-inch scratch on their car. I was amazed. I was amazed. But the reality is that when we get stuck in the past, or when we allow others to get us stuck in our past, then our past ends up defining our future, not because it has to, but because that's where our attention is placed. But your past does not need to define your future. The past is good to learn from. So my mistakes, I learn from them. And my victories, I can learn from as well. And they inform me and help me as I move forward. Hopefully I drive better now than I drove back then, right? Because I've learned the lessons. But to stay stuck in the past is not where God wants us to be. And these 
two people wanted Moses to be stuck in a past decision. And I want you to with me, could you just say this with me? Say, Jesus, today I step forward. I release the past and move forward. How many can say amen to that? Imagine if you were a leader who is stuck in the past. I mean, I, I was blessed, you know, that Alfredo pulled out his phone to use the, the, the to use the Bible right there. You know, I've actually gone to the past, and I now am using my Bible. I used to use my phone, but uh, this is a good past. I'm nothing wrong with that one. But uh, the reality is, is that if you're going to lead people and influence people in your life, whatever that looks like, in the church, in business, your family people around you, friends that you have, whatever it looks like, you can't lead them anywhere if you're stuck in the past. And so if you want to lead other people somewhere, if you want to influence people for something, then you got to be moving forward into what God has for you. And so be that type of person. The past does not define the future. Verse 4. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam and said, Go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three of them went to the tabernacle. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam were called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself, myself in visions. I would speak to them in dreams. But not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to what word does he say right there? To criticize my servant Moses. Be careful to criticize the people that God has chosen. Now let me let me flesh this out for you because I actually want to tell you something good. I want to say this, and I say this all the time when I'm preaching, but it, it bears repeating again. You are chosen. Amen. You're chosen by God. Tell somebody that. You're chosen. Amen. This is such an important truth. Now, Moses was chosen, and let me tell you that nobody here will be chosen to be like what Moses was. No, that, that, that was a unique thing that existed for Moses in that period of time. But that does not change the fact that you are still chosen by God and have been anointed by God. Can anybody say amen? amen. You have been chosen by Him. But see, here's the problem with most every human and it includes Christians, and if I can do my part to get you to move away from this, then you will live a blessed life. And here it is. We too often get concerned about the other people that God has chosen for other things. We play the comparison game. Well, you know what? Look, look, look. look. That person, look at the things they got. Look at the benefits they have. How did they get that benefit? How did they get that blessing? How did they get that position? It's not fair. It's not right that they got what they got. Can I just tell you something? If you live your life worrying about what God has chosen other people to do, you will miss out on what God has chosen you to do. Stop worrying about what other people, yeah, but you don't understand. I, I've got the short end of the stick and they've got the blessing. Let me tell you, you stay in the lane that God has put you in and you will get the blessing that God has prepared for that lane. In place. It'll come. It'll come. And so will you trust Him? The question is, will you trust God with that? You have been chosen, but you've not been chosen to be what somebody else is or to do what somebody else does. You've been chosen to be who God has made you to be. I remember, I remember, because there's a whole lot of people that even try to choose themselves. And this is what Mar Miriam and Aaron were doing. Them criticizing Moses was not about Moses. It was actually about them and what they wanted. What they wanted was to be in charge. And Moses was their obstacle to them being in charge. So they wanted to get rid of Moses so they could be in charge. And that was the real reality of what was going on. I remember 20 years ago, before I was a pastor, before I was a youth pastor, I was a youth leader 
in, in a group, and there was no youth pastor. It was like four or five of us, and we were together just planning stuff like a team and making stuff happen. And so I remember one day when a family member of mine came up to me and said to me these words back then, like I said, but over 20 years ago. And he said to me, he said, hey, I just met the youth pastor. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There is no youth pastor. He's like, yeah, yeah, I met the youth pastor. And I'm like, well, what's his name? And he tells me the name. The guilty will not be named right here today. But uh, my mom was like, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. He introduced himself to me and he said, I'm the youth pastor for that youth group. I said, I just started laughing. I'm like, this dude's hilarious because there is no youth pastor. He is naming himself. He is choosing himself. I've got a question for you. Who believes we have a great God? If you believe that, you do not need to waste your time attempting to choose yourself. Let God choose you. He'll do the choosing. And where He places you, no person will be able to get rid of you. God will move you exactly where He needs to move you. Because you know what? The guy that chose himself ended up not being selected to be the youth pastor. It ended up being me. Go figure. That's the way that God works. Would you just trust Him? He has chosen you. He knows what He has for you. And you can trust Him. That will give you a leadership that follows God and is not worried about everybody else or what they say or what they think or what they do. Let other people be who they are and just trust Jesus with your life. Amen. 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 Verse 9. I love this. It says, the Lord was very angry with them, and he departed. As the cloud moved from above the tabernacle, there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy, because she dared to go against, watch this, not against Moses. Because remember, Moses had been chosen by who? By God. So who was she going against, really? Not Moses. She was going against God. And this is an important thing to remember for where I'm going to go in just a moment. So she ends up with leprosy. When Aaron saw what had happened to her, he cried out to Moses, Oh, my master. It's like, yeah, finally you get the right words. You know, oh, my master, please don't punish us for this sin we have so foolishly committed. Don't let her be like a stillborn baby already decayed at birth. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Oh, God, I beg you, please heal me. Her. Can I show you something right now? Moses did not leverage his position to bring them punishment. God punished them, not Moses. In fact, what I love about Moses, his humility is shown, is that he actually prays for God to reverse the punishment on the people who mistreated him. Oh God, would you give me that type of heart? Man. A heart that looks out even for the best of the enemies. But that's what Moses had. And it leads to this important truth. God is our defender. He's your defender. Listen, wherever God gives you influence, there's going to be people that come against you. That is going to happen. It's normal. I've had that my entire life. I'm sure most of you have had that your entire life. Because as you make more waves and as you move more into what God has for you, there's naturally going to be people who don't like what's going on. And that's okay. But we don't need to defend ourselves. We can trust God to be our defender. We can pray blessing over people. Imagine that. And then let God do what he's going to do with the people he's going to do it with. And so she ends up with leprosy for seven days and then was healed after that. And I want to jump to Numbers chapter 16 for this last perspective because what's really interesting is there's a guy named Korah. And this is just a little while later. And Korah apparently didn't learn the lesson of Miriam. 
He didn't learn the leprosy lesson. He didn't learn the respect lesson. He didn't learn the lesson of honoring and following God above all and not worrying about what Moses was up to. And so it says in verse 3 of chapter 16, they united against Moses and Aaron, led by this guy named Korah, and they said this, you have gone too far. They're saying this to Moses. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord and he is with all of us. They were right on that one. He was with all of them. But the next part they got wrong. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? Question for you. Did Moses act like he was greater than everybody else? Answer? No. It was a false accusation. Let me be clear. When you follow Jesus, you will get false accusations. It is going to happen. It happened to Joseph, who was falsely accused and ended up going to prison as a result of it. It happened. Listen, they falsely accused Jesus. So if Jesus didn't escape from it, and he was perfect. He never sinned. And how much more is that going to happen to us as well? But here's what I know. Here's what I know. And what the story with Miriam and Aaron shows and what this story shows, which I'm going to read in just a second. This is what I know. God will use evil for your good. Amen. God will use, hear me on this. He won't do good in spite of evil. No, no, no. He will use the evil for your good. He will turn it around. Our God is the God of the turnaround. He knows how to flip something on its head that was designed and purposed for one thing. And he says, yeah, that's great. I'm going to use my death and then rise from the dead, right? I'm going to have Joseph. Yeah, he's going to go to jail, but he's going to go straight from jail to the palace. Right? and be the number two in all of Egypt. God has this way of literally leveraging every single evil plan of the enemy in order to do his good purposes in your life. And we'll show it. Verse 32, or 31. I'll start there and just read it real quick. You just see this. He had hardly finished speaking. This is Moses who was talking. He hardly finished speaking the words when the ground suddenly split open beneath them. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the men, along with their households and all their followers who were standing with them, and everything they owned. So they went down alive into the grave, along with all their belongings. The earth closed over them, and they all vanished from among the people of Israel. Verse 34, all the people around them fled when they heard their screams. The earth will swallow us too, they cried. Then fire blazed forth from the Lord and burned up the 250 men because these men were going against Moses who were offering incense. And how many would be like, amen, God, do that to my enemies as well? Praise Jesus. You know. you know, see, what I love about Moses is Moses did not wish ill on people, but he trusted God to be his defender. Because where God had placed him was where God wanted, and God wasn't going to allow anybody else to take him away from that place. And just know this. If God allows somebody to move you from somewhere, to change something, you get fired, you get kicked out, you get thrown out. Could you just trust God that he's got a plan and a purpose? And it's not that he's taken away his hand from your life. It's that it's part of the process that God is using to take you to exactly where he wants you to go. Amen. Can we just trust Jesus for that? Can anybody say amen? Amen. amen. Come on, give that And so if you want to be the best leader and impact this world, then become the best follower. Moses, the leader of the people of Israel, learned how to follow God. Aaron and Miriam had some trouble with that. But they learned their lesson because by the time we get to chapter 16, it says that they all came against Moses and Aaron, which means that Aaron learned the lesson and he stuck with Moses for the rest of it and understood where God had placed them and said, okay, God, I get it. I accept it. I will follow as you want me to. And then God was able to use Aaron for what God wanted to use Aaron for. Would you just simply follow Jesus and God will give you all that he needs to give you. That's what these stories show to us. Let's be people that let criticism down by the side 
aside and let go of comparing ourselves to other people. And let's just become a people and say, God, I am where you want me to be. I will trust you. I will follow you. I will influence those you want me to influence. And then I'm going to move forward in all you have prepared for my life. And if we would do that, that would be powerful in this world. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness, for who you are, for all you do with us, in us, and through us. I pray, Lord God, that you would, by your power, continue to work in our lives. And Jesus, that we would see you and we would walk with you. Lord God, there is no person on this earth or in heaven who is better for us to follow than you are. We want to be your followers. We want to obey you. We want to walk with you. We want to experience your goodness and your life that is so much better than anything this world provides. And with all eyes closed just for a moment, if you are here today and recognize your need for Jesus, your need to step in to the fullness of the life that Jesus offers, maybe for the first time, you need to say yes to Jesus, your Savior, your Lord, the one who died for you and rose from the dead for you to give you life. Or maybe you just need to return to Jesus, return to his ways. If that's you here today, would you just raise up a hand real quick so I can pray for you and believe God for all he wants to do in your life. Thank you so much, young man. Thank you so much. Hands are being raised around the room. May today be your day of experiencing. Thank you so much for that hand and walking in the fullness of all that God has for you. As you step into it, may you experience His grace, His love, His mercy, and His life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give an applause to the Lord right now.